The first real day of spring, and isn't it a wonderful thing? The sun had not yet risen over the horizon when I had my pack stuffed, my breakfast eaten, and I was out the door, skipping across the brook and on my way. Robins were scratching at the newly revealed earth, and even red-tailed hawks, seeking food and nesting material, were soaring overhead, their cries declaring they own the sky. Today is the first day. It really feels like spring. The first day the weather is really warm, and quickly all the land is transforming. And for my part, I had no better plan than to get as deep as I could into the forest and figure out what animals were up and about and what possible fungi were putting in an appearance. Is it just me, or do you also see the grumpy old troll in the knot on that ancient tree? It was a long hard hike to get to the woods so early, and by the time I reached its brink, I thought I had earned a rest. So I settled in, had some water, a few granola bars, and took a nap. And when I woke, I realized the forest had more to teach me than I thought to find that day. There is a story in every forest that begins with the first warm breath of spring. It abounds in the spring breeze, vigorous and eager, and you can find it in lichens sending forth their spores, and it seems even to spring from stone sprouting crystal. It is the tale of the return of life, and as that tale reanimates the land, tiny brooks not long ago frozen flow once again like the blood vessels of Earth's own heart. Like the cilia of vast lungs, the trees respire for Earth, inhaling carbon, giving forth life-giving oxygen. That life-giving breath touches Earth and sky and rejuvenates all things. Yet even before spring at last and for sure overwhelmed winter, life was striving to overcome the time of cold, shown here in these horse of fungi, which have managed to grow despite the winter by taking advantage of the odd warm day that snuck in through winter's gray. So hardy though are the horse of fungi that even those that emerge many seasons back yet may outlast the husk of the tree that they grew upon. Beside them in a neighboring hardwood, a cavity in a tree sits dark, but promising the respite of a pileated woodpecker or whatever other creature can manage to seize it. In a healthy woodland, old and new fungi are everywhere to be found as soon as the blanket of snow is pulled back. And no sooner is the earth revealed to the sky than mycelia, the underground living threads that are the very heart and souls of the fungal kingdom veritably burst forth from the earth, seeking places to grow, to manifest, and to carry on the circle of life. Lichen, amazing organisms that are part plants or bacteria and one or two parts fungi, 
send forth their first spores of the season. Even in the ancient stumps of long fallen trees, we see in the cubical forms of disintegrating wood, springs reanimation of life. This cubical decay is caused by fungal action, such as the mycelia of Pleurotus ostriatus, the oyster mushroom devouring the old wood, sequestering the carbon, and returning the nutrients to the soil. As a cloud rolls over the high valley, bearing a shock of cool moisture, and I take shelter in what might seem a dreary moment, I am reminded that, in a healthy woodland, everything has a niche, everything has a place, and everything supports the next. As if to reward me for my revelation, when the cloud passes and I emerge from the hollow stump where I had been taking shelter, I find there was at my feet a number of small holes in the earth beneath this hardwood. The old tree where I sheltered is a beach, and at its base these tiny holes could possibly represent the cache of a squirrel, or they might likewise represent the tiny indentations where that squirrel was digging up truffles. But the spring forest was generous, and she had not yet given all her gifts. Sometimes I find the kindness of a forest could bring a man to tears, because if one but looks, everywhere, everywhere, there is generosity, as if a healthy woodland wants to nurture us as a mother. For just as I left the place where I suspect that a squirrel may have been digging up truffles, I found a log covered with the healing fungus, Tremati's versicolor, the turkey tail. I had only been scouting this forest to see what yet, maybe showing the first hints of coming back to life after winter's long sleep, but already the forest is providing. And though I had not intended to forage, I decided not to overlook this gift. I had a leftover Ziploc bag which I had used earlier to carry some granola bars. Now it'll carry a few hundred grams of healing fungi. Much ado is made of the healing fungus, Inonotus obliquus, more commonly known as chaga. And I would not debate chaga's virtues, but Tremati's versicolor is just as powerful, if not more so. And happily, it is much more common, much easier to find, and much less burden upon the forest ecology to harvest it. As I gathered in the perfect stillness that is the ever-moving forest, I thought I might also gather a gift for you, my viewer, and so I caught for you a moment of this perfect silence that is never truly without a sound, for I know that this kind of silence has become a rare thing in this present world. And so I passed a while beneath the variegated shadows of maples and beaches, touched only by a sun that transformed as quickly into cloud shadow, caressed by a wind that was now summer's warmth, now winter's shadow, and reveled in the perfect silence that was wind and tumbling water and wildlife, and found clarity in this timeless stillness. Moments after the task was done, another shadow rolled over the lip of the valley, and this time, it looked thick and felt cool enough that it might bring rain. But it was trickster weather, coyote weather, and only moments later the sun reappeared. The forest, even the sky itself, seemed to be in a playful mood. And I had a feeling, a feeling that something special might happen. So I drew my camera, and I sat in the shadow of a stump, and I waited. And then the magic happened. They seemed to materialize out of the perfect stillness, the horned ones, mother and fawn, dancing between sunlight and shadow. After they passed, I sat there in sun and shadow myself, as if smitten, as if dazed. And it took me a long moment to regather my thoughts and continue on my way. But the forest, ah, the forest, she is wiser than I, and she had more gifts to give, more than I could hope for more than I could carry, and a wise man knows his limits. Best to take only what one needs, and leave the rest to its own fate.
and with heart and mind, camera and backpack full, it was time to make my way from the forest as the day waned. Still, the forest had many more beauties to share, and I had yet space on camera and recorder. The music of owls hooting, the song of the wind, the cries of coyotes, and even the frightened calls of snowshoe hares. All this timeless beauty, it is an intoxicating thing, and it was a slow journey back to camp. And there are many stories found therein, and perhaps we will share them, you and I, around another fire. <laughs>